You're listening to Funny Peculiar with Jeff Downs. Welcome to another episode of Funny Peculiar Podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for downloading. Thanks for sharing. I've got a great guest coming up. He's called Val and Vane. I'll tell you more about that in the intro. Just to say, you can get him on all major platforms. He's on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It's Val and V-A-L-E-N-V-A-I-N. Val and Vane. Without further ado, let's go and meet Val and Vane. So, welcome to another episode of Funny Peculiar. And on my quest for all different types of acts, this week I have my very first, not burlesque, but boylesque, and he's a male performer, and it's hello to Val and Vane. Hello, how's it going? I'm good, and how are you? I'm very well, thank you, yeah, and, yeah. And do I, am I getting your name right? Val and Vane, I'm saying that right, aren't yeah, I? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Val and Vane. And you're on Instagram, let's just get the check out of the way now, because I think anybody listening, uh, and I've been on your Instagram site, that's great, great photos, have a look, from, <laughs> so it's Val and V-A, L-E-N Vane, which is V-A-I-N for anybody listening. I'll put all your information on the iTunes bio. I'll prefix it and postfix it at the end. So all your information. And you're on Facebook as well and Twitter. I think I'm pretty much on all of them, I think. all of them, (laughs) yes, on all of those. The Holy Trinity, which seems to be Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. So brilliant. That's fantastic. And um, so so how long has Valen been going for? Um, oh, geez, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, pretty much been going for about six, seven years, seven years, I think. I started as a uh, male model originally, um, went to the Bizarre Ball back when Bizarre Magazine was, was a big thing. Ah, um, yes. And for people that, a, just to say, for people who don't know, because we've got a, probably a bit of a global audience, so Bizarre Magazine over in the UK is, and I don't know if that Bizarre is elsewhere, but it's it's like a... It's a sort of fetish magazine, really, isn't it, for just um, alternative lifestyle clothes yeah, it was, outfits? It, it was. It was very much a, an, an alternative lifestyle magazine. So I think it possibly originally started as a fetish magazine, but then they started adding in peculiar stories from across the world and and all kinds of stuff. But it was always that the eye catcher was um, a latex model on the front cover, which yes. always caught everyone's eye. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I remember because it was, yes, and someone with perhaps a bolt through their neck or some sort of yep. curious sort of image. But yes, the, tatu- the, the latex was the big, the latex model. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so, uh, so that was, so that's, and was it what looking at that magazine that kind of sort of got you into the, the look and, and the? Well, I was all, no, I was always intrigued by the the magazine because uh, alternative fashion couldn't have been extreme enough for me. Right. Um, so it's pretty much since I got into it, I was always pushing the boundaries of what I could get away with without getting uh, punched or or worse. Um, so yeah, it was it was that that kind of caught my eye as something that was a bit out there that none of my friends were really into, but I sure. I could really push the boundaries with. And then, uh, like I say, the the bizarre magazine company, so bizarre themselves, um, they had this big ball. It was it was just such a an amazing event, and it was the first type of event that I'd ever been to that was like that. Um, and they had like a photo booth area and acts on throughout the night and it, it really blew my mind and so that kind of was the beginning of starting my male modeling and the creation that was my uh, excessive vanity <laughs> <laughs> so that was and so and looking at your just your skype picture is wonderful you look great um and, and it, it's, it's i love the lips i love the it's a sort of mixture of the sort of the power of the male image with slight like robert smith and the cure female undertones and, and yeah, I love yeah. that look. Um, uh, is that kind of... Uh, how did you sort of slowly build Valen's look? Um, it's it's really been an evolving process. I, I can't say there's any been anything that's been specific about it. It's just about... It's always been about pushing the boundaries more and more and yeah. being inspired by um, as, as many different uh, models out there as possible. There's a fantastic um, model and event organiser over in the States called uh, Perish Dignam. Right. And... Or, or just perish as he is he well known as um but he's he's got a really extreme style he makes it all his own clothes he has his own nightclub um and he i would probably say he was definitely a big influence on okay. a lot more of the more excessive um outfits that exactly. i have and he's called perish dignum is he i think that's his that's his, that's his name. full name but i think he's like he just goes by the ma- male model perish right um, okay that's a great and name and he's based yeah. over in the states 
Yeah, I think he right. it's LA and he's got Club 69, if I remember co- okay. correctly. So he's very much in the right scene. <laughs> so no, that's but because there is a lot now. I mean, and I think you're a bit of a, uh, you know, you, you're sort of pushing the boundaries back then because uh, when, was, when was that when you went to that bizarre club? Can you remember? So the bizarre ball, so that would have been right at the beginning. So that must have been eight years ago okay. so that was a long time ago and, that yeah. was, and there wasn't much and now we've got Torture Garden again for people that don't know Torture Garden's another fetish event it's big in London more are growing and there's lots around Europe but I think back then you wouldn't have had so much so you were part, You were kind of quite brave to do that really did you feel you know you're having to push your push your sort of courage here to get out there push your boundaries I can't, if I'm completely honest, I'm I, I'm one of these uh, strange individuals. So, you know, like some people get like uh, anxiety and they, yeah. they really cl- clam up with nerves. Well, I'm like the opposite end of the okay. spectrum. I just don't get nervous at all. I will push the bounds out as much as humanly possible. Um, when I was 16, there was a, a classic example of uh, my parents refusing to let me go out of the house because I was going to a chav birthday party and I was dressed in a PVC nurse's outfit. <laughs> they, they kind of they were very liberal and open minded, but they kind of drew the line there. Yeah. <laughs> so but, that, was... but, but that but that's an amazing coach. But do you think that was because they were sort of they were sort of frightened that you might get beaten up or attacked? Yeah, oh, completely and utterly. My my parents were new romantics. Um, oh right, okay. So they were they were quite extreme in their own styles. So but, this is... so they go on, carry on. Sorry, I was just saying. Yeah, they were they were really they were really encouraging of me to to help me push my things. And it, I remember a great conversation. My my dad's an absolute legend. And um, but there was a a classic scenario when I was like thirteen. When you know when you're going through the the questions you're trying to identify yourself you're trying to work out exactly who you are and where you stand and I was getting really conscious about what I was wearing not wearing the right things whether it was a capper or umbro or whatever and I was having this argument with my dad and my dad just kept saying but what does it matter to everything I ever said so it was like I, I wanted this. I wanted to wear a certain outfit, and he was like, "Yeah, but what's it matter?" He's like, "Oh, well, my friends won't like me if I'm not wearing this." And he's like, "Yeah, but if then your friends, then they will like you. Or why? Why would you bother?" And it was always that constant, "Why yeah. do you care?" And it was only when that really hammered in, I was just like, "Do you know what? I don't care." If these people can't accept me for who I am, then yeah. psh, who cares about them? Cares? Why, why would I bother with them? Well, that's well, and and ex- exactly. And why would you? Who needs friends like that when you should just exactly. be allowed to? So let, let's go see your fr- So your parents are so they're two sort of like they've been there. They were kind of wild childs themselves, and they were new romantics, and they were into dressing up. I take it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They, I've got. I'm pretty sure they possibly still have the uh, like a big old like uh, everything that they used to wear in the '80s got put in a big trunk, and that was my uh, favorite place to go to, so, <laughs> to dress up and wear the crazy outfits. So this is where kind of the young Valen was probably born. Was was this your parents' dress up box, which is kind of in a way I can see the new romantic looking at your pictures. There's a sort of yeah. there's a theme going on there. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And to be honest with you, um, I absolutely love, I love different styles. And my main issue, especially as I've got older, my main issue is people putting people in boxes. Yeah. Like, you, you, the, I've, I've recently found out a friend of mine's um, little brother's like 16. And whereas everyone used to get called Mosher and Goth when I was younger, and now yeah. everyone gets called Emo. And it's just like, can't people just be themselves and wear what the hell they want? Of course. I'll, I'm I'm wandering around and people are like, oh, I really like your top. And I'm like, yeah, it was from Topshop. And they, they look at me strange as if, why why have you bought a top from Topshop? Well, I liked it, so I bought it. Simple as. <laughs> so, and, There's not really much more to it. And this is, and of course, uh, and so as you're growing up, and, you're, and especially when you get into your teen years, that's when it becomes quite difficult because we're all changing and working for our look. So you're really pushing the boundaries. So would you say you were sort of goth when you started to get into this look? Yeah. Uh, um, well, it, I think it pretty much started when it started with the classic mosher, so big baggy jeans, big baggy t-shirt, skater boy style style things, and then as time went on, I realised that the goth um, outfits were a lot more extreme, and I enjoyed them a lot more. Um, I remember going to uh, school wearing eyeliner because it said in the school rules that girls can't wear makeup, but it said nothing about boys wearing makeup. They changed a few school rules because of the really? way I was. <laughs> yeah. So that, so what, what did that, what happened when you the first day or you walked where wore eyeliner? Were you like hauled into a 
a matter yeah. of headmaster's yeah, yeah. office. Really, what do they Pre- say? Pretty much grabbed by the ear and uh, dragged into into an office. Thing is, it's despicable that I was wearing makeup and I go against the school rules. And then I had that wonderful snide grin of pulling out the school rules and saying, "Well, actually, it says girls can't wear makeup." <laughs> um, to which they were embarrassed, but didn't stop me from getting in <laughs> like detention. So. Yeah, right. But well done. Fucking hell well, it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? I, I always towed the line. Like I always sat, well, especially in school, I always sat within the school rules. Yeah. So it was a case of, you must wear black shoes. I'd walk in in New Rocks. Um, it was uh, one oh, of what, those... Sorry, new, what's New Rocks? New Rocks. So they were, oh, I think they're still going, but um, they're like big uh, goth boots, basically. Right. Oh, so, I know the ones. The very, yeah, yeah. the massive sort of chunky platform hill thing. Exactly. Ah, yeah, but right. lots of metal everywhere Brilliant. and buckles and stuff. Right, and right. so I'd I'd always tell the lad I'd do exactly what it said in the school rules. Yeah. And if the school rules were grammatically incorrect or didn't take into consideration these things, it's not really my fault. No, so no, it absolutely changed. not. <laughs> And they certainly changed a few in the following years. <laughs> and so, so this is the so as you're and you and you uh, live in Hull as well. So, yes. uh, for people listening uh, who doesn't know UK, it's Hull sort of over the right on the coast of England, isn't it? Up in the north. Yeah. Uh, yeah the way I describe it is, if you look at a map of England, we're right in the armpit. <laughs> so, that's, <laughs> so that's right. So yeah, we're the armpit. Right. And and Hull's kind of got a what 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 and sort of growing up looking and being alternative and it's a kind of small province not a small provincial town but it's a city but it's still away from other cities it must have been quite daunting to walk around like that it's a, it's a real end of the line city yeah it's it, like you don't you don't come to hull unless you are going to hull you don't like pass through it like sheffield or leeds for example um i can't say i was literally daunt i think i was a bit of a an attention seeker if i'm completely honest i would never have admitted it when i was younger but yeah i, I, I liked it when people turned their head to stare and yeah. i liked um so you like that end- attention you like that do you f- that that even if it was in a bad or a good way you like the fact you were getting noticed I would say it was 95% in a bad way if i'm completely honest really? but at, at the end of the day the way i saw it was i'm not I'm not restricting myself by being boring and sticking to the fashions and sure. sticking to the trends. I'm I'm expressing myself in the way I want to express myself. Of and if course. people don't like it, much like my dad said mm. when I was uh, 13, what does it matter? Yeah, yeah. Do well, I hope, I hope for anybody listening, it will give them a bit of courage. To, you know, I do like that, what does it matter? Because in a moment, I, I suppose once someone does look in a negative way, it's a look. And they'll carry on walking, and you carry on walking, and the moment's gone. So, how did you get through that yourself? Do you just keep your head down, keep your head up, keep walking forward? What's your technique? Confidence, one hundred and ten percent confidence. If you strut around with enough confidence, you will get yourself anywhere in life. And mm. I can I can say that because of the fact that I've raided many backstage parties when I was not meant to be there, just because I've walked in as if I was meant to be there. Really? really? So, so who, who have you yeah. got? What sort of backstage parties have you got? Who have you? Um, the the classic one um, that I remember was myself and a model called Anya Sly. Okay. We went to see uh, Steel Panther play Lincoln, right. um, and we went to a, a like a nightclub afterwards. It was very trendy. It was like Tiger Tiger or um, very very much a house kind of dance music. Um, and we walked in with a group of people. We bought nine Jaeger bombs, and everyone else disappeared off. Right. So there was me and her wandering around this club with nine Jaeger bombs, trying to find the people we'd lost. And we got to the top floor um, and there was like a, a red rope across the this doorway. And because we were quite drunk anyway, I turned around and I was like, Anya, just move that rope across. And she was like, I'm not sure. And I was like, just do it. It's going to be fine. And we walked in and the uh, the bouncer came up to us. He was like, are you part of the Steel Panther party? And I was like, no, but we definitely should be. And he was like, I'm going to have to go check this. And we ended up having nine Jaeger bombs with Steel Panther and oh, they, right. they invited us in and, and we had a few drinks with them. It was a really good night. So. And Steel Panther, is that like a heavy metal goth band? Is so it? Steel Panther's actually, a, they're, they're a parody band of the old um, 80s hair metal. Ah, right, they're, okay. And music is all gross and um, gratuitous yeah. and very much into sex, drugs and rock and roll and their stage performance is very similar. Um, 
side of things, but they put on an amazing stage performance and they, they yeah, they've got songs like um, 17 Girls in a Row and Glory Hole and okay. it's all very yeah, in your face. Sort of, oh, uh, brilliant. But, but it's, it's fun. It's fun. So, and so... So we've got the young Valen walking around Hull. So, or, or, so, and did, before you then came up with Valen Vane, uh, what were you at art college? Were you doing theatre? What sort of? How did you get into that sort of performance side of stuff? Um, I've always really been into theatre. Um, so I, I was doing acting, and I, I went to university and did a, a theatre degree. Um, though towards the end of the degree, I was so tired of being a performer that i ended up doing like a lot of the backstage stuff so like lighting and sound and stuff um then i left uni and didn't want anything to do with theater for a while um got back into it slowly but surely but again it was my my problem was it was never quite extreme enough again is is going back to this what what boundaries can be pushed yeah. which is probably why i found um the bizarre ball so so interesting yeah because it really it really showed me that you don't have to stick to with it like theater can be more than just being on stage saying the words of a 400 year old play or whatever yeah like it, it can be you can really push the boundaries and that's when i really started getting into the cabaret side of things um and the boylesque and pole and aerial and and all that side of stuff and that and tell us about the boylesque because and for people listening as well burlesque is uh, a very uh, you know famous traditional cabaret yes. uh, yeah. which is mainly women uh, doing a strip tease of some sort not fully but that sort of act no that's, yeah that's... so it was basically originally designed to to toe the line between stripping stripping and um or as i understand it that was what it was it was the closest that men could get um without seeing the the whole shebang um, right. and the, the whole the whole idea behind burlesque especially when it became a bit more famous was it wasn't there to be gratuitous it wasn't there to be in your face oh look at us where where women with our tits out it was more about the tantalizing it was more elegant yeah. than that um which is why i i really was quite interested in it um which is interesting because the first few burlesque nights i went to uh were were not like that at all it was a lot yeah. more in your face which really threw me from what i understood yeah. um burlesque to be but yeah i mean boylesque is the term itself you you get some people that say boylesque some people that say male burlesque it's it's all burlesque to be honest with you yeah. i think the difference is that like the way i like to compare it is um back when david bowie first started singing and um, there's a famous interview that he did and now I've said that he's a famous interview. I can't remember which one it was, but he did. He did this famous interview, and he basically said that when he was younger, to be a musician was to rebel. That yeah. was it. That was that was he was rebelling just by being a musician. Mm -hmm. And that's to be fair. Why all of the the old um, the older the old school musicians like David Bowie and Prince and um, even Queen to they cross so many genres of music and they got away with it because they were. They, they were these people nowadays there's so like there's so many different genres that people i was going back to what i said before people like to be put in boxes or like to put things in boxes so you you get exactly the same in the the cabaret world you go right okay there's burlesque and then you've got boylesque and then you've got gorlesque which is burlesque but with like blood and and horror oh, style okay. things Oh, um, I've not heard of that one. Gorlesque. Okay, so Gorlesque, yeah. right. So it's always there's always sub genres of sub genres yeah. that keeps for whatever people like. So, um, and so, so you decide. So when you went to that night, you were like, ah, right, I I can do this. There's something here. And and so, how did the act develop? And to and be honest with you, it actually, it, it like I said. So I went to Bazaar, and I like the the whole idea of it blew my mind. Yeah. Um, and that's when I started really thinking about events, but I've, I've sort of put that to a side because I never had really had the money to worry about it. Um, so I, I was a male model for about four years, okay. an alternative male model for about four years and before was, I really started getting. And, and yeah. just quickly talk, so being an alternative male model. So what what would that into? You're not doing the general catalogue poses and jumpers and smart trousers. What sort of stuff are you modelling? It was, to be honest with you, it was a lot more about expressing yourself. So there were occasions when you'd uh, do stuff specifically for alternative clothing companies right. um, for, for their websites and what have you. Sure. But the vast majority of um, 
gigs that I did was, or, or shoots, should I say, yeah. was going down um, with a selection of stuff from my own wardrobe. Normally, when you've got a good portfolio, um, people pick certain things and go, oh, I really like this, but could we change it up a little bit and what have you? And for the first, for the beginning bit, um, the beginning side of things, you'd go down with a suitcase full of stuff. And in my experience, I people kept trying to like asking me to, to come and be their model because I had such a wide array of really strange, obscure, interesting clothing. Mm. So more people would want to be finding, like get shots of that stuff, right. which is kind of the reason why, like the way I, I managed to establish myself. Sure. And what sort of, just, just describe a couple of pieces of clothing that you might wear on those shoots. So were you talking latex trousers or corsets or what? what the of... early days, it really it really wasn't. So it'd be like a fur loincloth. And okay. um, there was like a guy had a bow and arrow and one of the photographers was like, oh, can we borrow the photo, bow and arrow? And grabbed me over with this fur loincloth and big fur boots yeah. and had me into some kind of caveman cupid. It was right, okay. it was really strange sort of, of things. But yeah, it was always, it always like ended up as tight trousers and like circusy style hats and really strange like waistcoats and what have you and and to be honest with you you definitely get a, a mishmash of stuff some of my oh i'm trying to remember now it was so long ago what what was it i think it all started when i met a model it all started really when i met a model called evie wolf who right. i am uh, very good friends with now yeah, yeah. um and she used to do these shoots at the pit in the pendulum in uh, nottingham right and she and was very sorry. Confused. The pit and the pendulum. Yeah. So that's a that's a club, is it? A bar? A pub? That's a bar. bar. Yeah, it's a it's like it's like a um, alternative pub. It's I think it's probably the the most famous alternative pub in okay. Nottingham. There are quite a lot of them, but it's it's probably the one that most people know. Yeah. Um, and above the pub, there used to be I don't know whether it's still there now, but there used to be like this old warehouse area. Yeah. It was like it's like old wooden boards and uh, all dusty and what have you and. It was it was actually a pretty good location for photo shoots. So and I that, ended up, yeah. And that's sorry, that's where it started. So you, you, that's where the look sort of came about. Do you think for Valen? It started, so, yeah. To be honest, it started with um, me emailing Evie saying I'd like to be part of this shoot, and she yeah. was like, "Well, actually, it's an invitation only shoot." And um, I, I I don't know how to be honest with you. I managed to to change her mind because I was a brand new model. I didn't have anything going for me. She didn't know who I was, um, and she but she she said, "Yeah, you can come down." And the theme was the seven deadly sins and the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Right. And at that point, I was just like, "You're right. I'll let let's milk this for all it's worth." And <laughs> definitely did. Had a really good laugh. Met some amazing photographers. Met some amazing models. And actually, I was staying the night at. Um, somebody's house and one of the models was like i'm actually at a photo shoot in the same in in a close area yeah tomorrow if you want to come down and join us and i did i just stayed there for the, uh, an extra day um did another photo shoot and and it all spiraled out of control oh, from wow. there, really. but again this this confidence thing that you've got seems to be helping you out in these situations that you just you just push a bit further and and this is perhaps a lesson for everybody just just keep as long as you're confident um you you'll you'll follow it through and you'll get something 100 percent. and and to be honest with you if we're gonna go into the uh the the history behind it i i i lied my confidence i was a really self-conscious like teenager um yeah. and so a lot of people that meet me are like no never you how do you manage to get from where how do you manage to get from this super self-conscious teenage kid to the way you are now um and it all started with a lie it all started with me telling like, me lying to other people about how confident i was yeah and slowly but surely that lie became real confidence <laughs> i was just like yeah yeah i can do this yeah it's grand i, I don't care about what anybody thinks i always cared about what people think when i was 13 14 and as time went on i realized that i just didn't care and i just wanted to be the person that i was and it got yeah. more and more out there and the more i expressed myself and the more people turned their heads the more my confidence grew so that's a well that's a great that's i think that's a great sort of life lesson there just to yeah. just 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 to give you because no one really and i've done performance and you know you have to g yourself up you have to try and give yourself confidence and sometimes 
we're so good at doing ourselves down and you have to sometimes say, look, I can do this. And, and, and it's almost like a little lie to yourself. It's like, you'll be fine. Yeah. You think you won't be, but once you get on stage, you do the gig, whatever you are, you're fine. No one's died. You carry on. So it's oh, like... completely and early. What's the worst that can happen? You get, you get booed. Oh, what a shame. You're still are there and you're still doing your piece. You're giving it your all. So long as you give it everything you can, then, that you, nobody can really fault you. And when was the first gig you did as Val and Vane, so as Boylesque? So how, how? let's get to, fast forward to, where was that night and how, how did that it go? That was, um, I think the first time I did Boylesque, so I got into Boylesque because I did Aerial Hoop for a while, then got yeah. bullied into pole dancing. Right. And uh, basically because the Aerial Hoop place was where the same place where I did pole dancing and the... Yeah. Uh, the pole instructors were all really nice ladies, yeah. but they were all like, "You need to come and do this." Um, and one of the the actual my aerial tutor at the time was um, Roxy Royale. Right. She's a um, the Yorkshire lass with the regal ass, as her <laughs> slogan goes. Um, and she she put on a uh, she used to do a relatively regular uh, uh, burlesque nights and cabarets, and she put on one on. And I was like, oh, "Can I do it?" Um, and she was like, "Yeah, sure, Brilliant. jump in." And that was basically the first one, the first time I did it. And it was really bizarre as well because I'd not really thought about it. I kind of said it out of hand. I was like, look, can I do Boy Less? Because I kind of fancy the, the idea of it. Yeah. And she was like, yeah, sure. And then it was in like two weeks' time or something. I think somebody had dropped out, if I remember correctly. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, and subsequently had to then find a, find a song, get an outfit, do a routine. And I think I ended up wearing like uh, the first routine I did, I was wearing tights. I was yeah. wearing two pairs of tights to make it look like trousers and got some scissors and cut them off because I had no rip-off trousers. Right. So I made a, a big thing about cutting these tights off. <laughs> it was oh, it was, it was bizarre. Really good fun, really good fun. But it was it was literally a case of if these don't come off, then we'll see what happens. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you, so and what were you, did you have boots on or were you wearing heels? Or I was wearing uh, the, uh, that specific outfit. I was wearing spats, but I left the spats on. So oh, I was right. wearing um, like normal shoes some yeah. spats over the top yeah. and cut these um Tights. things off so I, and so i ended up in this and what tiny was, little pair of pants so these pair pair of pants. And what, what, what was on your chest were your waistcoat a shirt or? Um, i've got a fancy waistcoat that had massive panels cut out of it it's right. like designed like that so um it, it was literally i think i was wearing a top hat this waistcoat some nipple pasties um, right. just because i wanted to join in Right, and nipple pasties and then, are what tassel things are they? Yeah, so they're yeah. they're like tassels, but without yeah. the tassely bit. So it's just, oh, pasties it's are just very like good. Um, or, uh, some people call them pasties, but that makes me think of Cornwall for some reason. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Somewhat less appealing. That's a, that's another burlesque night altogether. With uh, yeah, <laughs> so that's a, oh right, okay. So that and, and what was the music? What because this is a big part of burlesque. So what tracks did you dance to? That was. Oh, that is a good question. I think that was Roxanne from the Moulin Rouge. Ah, right, okay. So I really went down that that classic sort of um, in your face gratuitous. But then from that, like I've done um, one one of the popular pieces that I do is um, at grown Christmas time. I do a Grinch piece, oh, right. and that's that's a lot more comedy than it is yeah. um, like sensuality and and teasing yeah um but that that's a big one and you you end up with green fur everywhere and right. people love it but so when when you do that one for example just tell us about sort of the pose the way you start so uh, so you're doing a grinch i take it some sort of big green fur outfit uh and whereabouts are you on the stage are you t- i'm right in the middle of the stage and you right st- in the middle and you start and- completely outstretched or what's your body doing i, I start i start crouched down um, covered in this beautiful um, like Christmas style cape, and the beginning of the tune is the uh, like much from the the movie Jim Carrey movie. Yeah, uh, it's it's this beautiful sort of uh, voice singing. I think it's the theme tune as, at the beginning, and it's this glorious voice. And I do this like oh, it's almost like a little ballet routine, and then it slides into this very in, tongue in cheek, in your face. Um, gratuitous piece and it's not in like a full fur suit uh, I don't want to spoil it too much but no. yeah it's, it's more like there's green fur in certain 
places that that work really well on it. Fantastic. But yeah, it's it's I'm like pulling rotten bananas out my pants and stuff. So <laughs> it's, it goes with the song, but it, yeah, it's it, it's it, proper it's, minging. <laughs> it's and so and so where and all the different ideas you get. Where do, how do you keep the act fresh? Where do you get your ideas from? It, all over. If I'm completely honest, sometimes I see an outfit that I really want to um, dance to. Uh, sorry, uh, dancing. There's other times that I hear a song and I'm like, "This is a really good idea." A classic piece, the most recent piece that I've I've come up with um, is actually by a song by uh, some good friends of mine in a band called Saints of Sin, which right. is like uh, um, they, again they're a very hair metal-y style band, but they, they they but that was because a friend of mine put on it was like a, a charity cabaret night and the theme was circus and he asked if I'd do it. I said, "Yeah, sure, I'd do it." And they had a song called Welcome to the Circus, and that's where that entire piece came from. Right. And that was a really obscure one as well, because um, I found out a few days beforehand that there was a hen party in in the crowd. Yeah. And subsequently, I decided to abandon half of my routine and just mounted their table and was doing all kinds. Oh. You've re- what I've realized is you really have to, to go with the flow with a lot of things, because... At the end of the day, a lot of things can mess up and it never goes right on the night, if I'm completely honest. Like, you can rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse it, but one small slip up, the the key to a lot of performances, especially in cabaret, is you're only on it for five minutes. If you slip up, sass it out. Yeah. You know I, what I mean? Just, I, the thing is, the audience won't... I think a lot of performers get conscious if they make a mistake someone in the audience is spotted but inevitably they never do because they think well it's all part of the act yeah they've got no idea absolutely no idea i've need myself in the eye i've <laughs> got um zips caught and i've ripped gloves off and yeah they they just think it's all part of the act so long as you give it enough energy and yeah. give it enough confidence everyone just goes wow that was really cool and i'm like well yeah that's my outfit ruined but yeah. you, you you all enjoyed it i'll fix it later and where and where do you perform mainly are you, are you up and down the uk are you in europe are you global where do you go it's pretty much just the uk at the moment i'm i'm i've kind of decided to i've got to make it in the uk before i uh, stretch out towards you not that i'd be against it if somebody offered me a, a role but i kind of want to make more of it but i think I actually want to fetish cabaret night yeah. um called ken kinky erotic nature good old plug there Very um, and when, when when when's that on so that's annually i've just done one All in right. uh june um right. the next one is may next year okay and whereabouts um, does that take place so that takes place in one of the venues in Hull. Actually, okay. I've, I've just changed venue because the venue I used to do it in was this beautiful old Victorian. It was like a converted Victorian cinema that had been converted into a nightclub. Right. Um, and that, so I did Ken on the 15th of June this year. Yeah. And I got told, oh, or it was confirmed that the venue was closing at the end of May. Right. So I got told that possibly with about three weeks notice before I had to find a new venue and oh, change it no. all over. Oh, and it was, it was a real shame because the, uh, the manager was, um, the manager of the old venue was kind of being messed about by the guy who owned the building. Um, so he was, he was really nice and he really tried to help me out. Um, like finding a new location and stuff, but I actually managed to find one myself in the end anyway. But oh, he was, well it, it was one of those things he was just trying like always apologizing. I was like, mate, it, it, you, I, you're doing all you can. All yeah. I can ask for is you are already doing so. Yeah, I can't fault you for it. Uh, um, and was it a good night? Was it a successful night? Did you have loads of people turn up? Um, it was. If I'm honest with you, it was a it was a loss for me. Right. In like monetarily, but the actual night itself was phenomenal brilliant like and and to be honest with you that's the kind of night as an event organizer yeah. that's the kind of night i would much rather lose money and everyone have an amazing time sure. than make money and people be complaining about this that and the other yeah yeah and like I, I started so i started um ken two years three years ago maybe yeah and the first the first one i did it was i did it like really sort of spur of the moment hired a load of performers from across the uk was um really worried because i'd sort of forked out 1500 quid to put it on knew i was going to make a loss that wasn't really a problem because you always do when it's the it's the first event yeah um but i had i had people from birmingham and manchester and london 
and I was like, oh my god, like th this is amazing. You guys have come from all over to a first event, which is really unique in in the fetish community because yeah. the fetish people, especially because of it's, it's quite a close. Even now, with with how open the world is to it, yeah, um, it's still quite a closed community. A lot of people like to keep it secret, and a lot of people won't come to a first event. Might not even come to the second event. They wanted to build a reputation yeah. before they think so the fact that these people came i was i was amazed and to be fair i actually spoke to um a couple of the london people that came and they said to me they were like valen we didn't know what was going on but we knew you were too arrogant to put on a shit night and i was like <laughs> <laughs> I'll, it's a backhanded compliment but i'll take it take, <laughs> I'll it, happily take, take it. it no that's have that that's a good that's one to have on the posters that <laughs> yeah. so, um, that's brilliant well listen again your just your confidence comes through and it's just a, a lesson to all of us to if you want something, just go and do it. And so, yeah. so Ken will keep going now. So that's that's to set up. Uh, listen, I'm going to try and get to that because there's I go to Fetish clubs. There's Club Lash in Manchester. Oh, brilliant! But, yeah, yeah. So I've been I know the people there, and I've interviewed actually a plug for my show. Episode six or seven is Jane Miller, who was one of the ladies, and she's been doing Lash for 19 years. So you can hear her talk all about Lash uh, Club Lash, but yeah, and Torture Garden came up to Manchester, and I've been to that. So, but yeah, I think the, the fetish clubs—it is a smaller community, isn't it? It is. It's a niche community, which, to be fair, considering that was like my first ever like event off my own back, I've been helping out with other people's events for years, but that was the first one that I did for myself. Yeah. Um, and it was quite a risky one to do it. So everyone go right, okay, you're getting what doing an event that you can't get funding for because it's fetish it's in the most niche market you can possibly do Pff, I, I, you know might as well start with the biggest challenge you know well, <laughs> work but, my way back uh, from there and who and just just describe some of the acts who did you book for that first one what sort of acts did you have come for that along? first one so yeah. I, Ro I mentioned roxy royale earlier yeah. um i booked her because um i know her really well and i know she puts on a great show yeah um Oh, I booked a hand balancer called Craig Gad from down in London. Right. Um, I booked a Mr. Freak, who I saw in your list earlier. Yeah. You had a um, thing. He was a contortion act that I That's had. That's it. He's been um, on the show. Brilliant. Yeah, Lolita Latex from Leeds. I think ah, she's still. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah, that sounds. She's, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. She she came on obviously with it being fetish I was like I'll I'll milk that but then since then I've I've really I sort of did that first one and then had a moment of panic of how do I escalate from here yeah. but then I've had I've had like hula hoop dancers Nula Hula from uh, Shrewsbury I think all right okay um she's she's a great hula hoop artist and she came down and played it I've had um more boylesque artists so I've had some midnight blues I've had um. John Celestus, who was at the last show. Um, I've had loads of burlesque artists. I've had Victorian strongmen and aerial hoop artists and and all kinds, really. So it's and, all a mishmash. So you've got lots of circus type acts going on. You've got everything yeah. there. So very Man, traditional cabaret. Uh, to be honest with you, I uh, as the ongoing gimmick every single time, because I, I compare the entire night. Yeah. Um, just because I, I love to do no, it. No, I, I can't believe that. I know, moment. what are the chances? What are the chances? <laughs> um, but I basically, I, I compare the entire night and the, the ongoing gimmick is the fact that I don't do it for the people that come. I do it because I want to see the acts. <laughs> and it's like, it's, it's, it's the ongoing, this isn't for you, this is to inflate my ego a bit more. Oh, wow. And every, yeah, everyone loves it. Oh, I've, I've yet to hear a complaint. I had one complaint after the first one and what was it? Um, Can you remember? I had because the first one I ever did, obviously with having no background to really work from, I decided I was going to do the cabaret. I had the dungeon in a separate room, and I was going to start off with the disco. Um, so just towards the end of the night, and I was that first one about three people danced, <laughs> and right, okay. so that because ev everyone sort of watched the cabaret, then just went straight up to the dungeon area, which yeah. was fine. It wasn't a problem. And yeah. um, but I had a guy email me afterwards. And he said, um, he, he was asking if the second one was going to be like the first one with the cabaret and then the disco and the dungeon. Yeah. I was like, yeah, it's going to be exactly the same format, but with different acts. And I'll, I'll try and spice it up and what have you. Yeah. And he was like, oh, well, um, I might I might not come then. And I was like, well, why? And he was like, because um, he, he didn't want any of the cabaret. He came for the disco. He, did, he was not interested in the cabaret at all. And I said to him, I was like, look, in the nicest way possible, I really don't give a fuck. Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
everyone else loves the cabaret. Everyone else is having a wild time. You were one of the three people dancing. Yeah. Um, in the, I, I'm going to appease the masses because yeah. as much as I'd like doing my own thing, um, and to be honest with you, that was my own choice anyway. I'd much prefer the cabaret and then the disco and stuff. Sure. Um, and, and just to and, say to people, and the dungeon area, because I've known that, that's normally a sort of play area, isn't it? A sort of yes, S&M play yeah. area, just for people who don't know. And so couples and whoever, consenting adults, and it's all very, that's what goes on there. So that's that's yes, cool. Yes, very much so. Um, I've got, um, uh, for, for the Ken Knights, there used to be a regular um, play event in Doncaster called Donimation. Right, okay. Um, and the, the people who ran Donimation are actually... My the the people who do all the dungeon master stuff. So basically, for those that don't know, people that go in and play in the dungeon, we, there's always a dungeon, or there should always be a dungeon master there, uh, just as monitors basically yes. to watch that things don't get too extreme. Sweet. That there aren't th- there there's no situation where there's no consent or or anything like that. They're they're basically there for everyone's safety and protection yeah yeah they're the car yeah absolutely and in but, fact i'm trying to get hold of there's a very good dungeon master at lash who's been doing it for years and so hopefully i'm going to interview him at some point but yeah that's a really good point it's it's a safety aspect isn't it just to yeah exactly and as much as i'm i'm quite um fluent in the fetish so to speak yeah um the like I, I knew that if I was going to be comparing and I was going to be doing this, I needed people I could trust and that had experience. Sure. So that's why I basically approached the the guys from Donimation and said, "Look, is there any chance that you could monitor the um, dungeon for me?" They they loved the idea, so they yeah. were more than happy to come down. Um, and nowadays, I actually use their equipment as well, so yeah. they they bring their equipment and yeah. also monitor the dungeon. Great bunch of people. Great That's bunch fa- of people. Fantastic. And so, uh, and, and what do your parents think now? You've come to this this hole this way. <laughs> Fallon, the clubs. What are they like? Are they like? Uh huh. Yeah, we knew he was going to be doing something like this. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they had some kind of inkling. Yeah, I'm a very like we're we're a pretty open family. Yeah. Um, my mother does t- tend to turn around and say, "Look, it, it, what I don't know doesn't hurt me, so uh, keep it to yourself." But <laughs> even even then, I, it doesn't really make a difference. They're always suggesting little things that might be improving from the event side of things, less the fetish side of things. But saying, "Look, why haven't you thought about this, that, and the other?" And I'm like, yeah. "Actually, do you know what? I really appreciate it." So I um, like that. That's, nine... a, that's a really good saying. Saying what I, what I don't know won't hurt me. I think that's another great. Your parents should. They should <laughs> writing a book. It's too great. Uh, quotes we've had from your parents so it's like uh, my parents are legends I'm not going to lie about it like I, I've been really fortunate because they've been really like, they're a really supportive pair um, yeah. and like I, I did really stupid stuff like I, I had a classic situation when I was in uh, when I was in my teenage years of being depressed because I had nothing to be depressed about do you know what I mean? It was yeah. it was such an angsty way of looking at it and I wrote them poems about how much I hate them because they wouldn't let me walk <laughs> let me do what I wanted to, but they always let me do what I wanted to. So yeah. it was absolutely ridiculous. Oh, it was, it, yeah. So in fact, the, possibly the hardest parents to rebel against because they would just let you do whatever yeah. you want to do. So 110%. How, how frustrating was that to sort of like... It was, yeah, it was It was really hard to be angsty when they pretty much... <laughs> it, I'd like to say they spoiled me, but they really didn't. They, they knew when to toe the line and they, they yeah. weren't thinking. But at the end of the day, nine times out of ten, they'd be like, as long as you're safe, that's fine. That's, that's brilliant. Okay. Okay, that's not an well, issue. I think that's a great way to sort of almost encapsulate and finish off because we started on your parents and they've just been a real uh, beacon of sort of hope and drive for yeah, you and that's massive. wonderful. And uh, so, but my last question, and I'm sure, hey, listen, I think there's a follow up episode here because you're very entertaining. It's been great <laughs> listening and everything you've spoken about, your pictures are great. So, who do you think I should have on the uh, podcast next or for a future episode? Who do you think I should interview? A uh, Roxy sounds fantastic. Uh, Roxy Royale would be a good one because she's she's been into burlesque for a long, long time and um, she she knows her way around it all. Um, there are uh, there's a pair down in London. Um, they they go by Gersh and Rox Presents. Gersh and Rock Presents. Yes, yeah, okay. Rox. So it's it's G E R S C H E. Right. And R O X. Rox. Right. Ah, um, right. But they I've only recently got to know them. Um, down in London, but they put on a variety of different cabarets and other really cool nights. But they, they like 
they are pretty much two of my go-to people if I'm ever down in London for something entertaining to do. Okay. Um, Gershon so, Rocks presents. So I'm Gershon gonna, Rocks. I will try and get those on the show. That sounds absolutely brilliant. So, And I said a fantastic back then. So to a friend that might be listening, Graham, apologies. I said fantastic too many times. As as, I, <laughs> as I've learned in this interview, have That's word, all right. That's uh, all right. So, I, I use the word phenomenal too often, so I'm, <laughs> I'm surprised that it was not it, in this interview. Is that, yeah, you do that. I do that as well. I have so Certain words we just use too much, so um, th- th- I like phenomenal. <laughs> have a have fantastic for a few, and I'll borrow phenomenal. So listen, by all means, <laughs> Valen, thank you ever so much today. It was absolutely You're more um, welcome. It's brilliant, and uh, <laughs> and I will um, I'll get all your details. On. You've been listening to Funny Peculiar. Tune in next week. More great guests. And indeed, if you do go on the uh, iTunes biog, you'll get all of Valen's details. Um, I'll put them up on the website, uh, funnypeculiar.org. All the details of all the guests are always listed up there. So I put them there. So a big thank you again to Valen Vane for coming on the show. He's on Instagram, he's on Twitter, he's on Facebook, he's on everything. Just put in Valen Vane, you'll find him. A great guy, um, and it was a great guest to have on the show. More coming next week. Who's it going to be? I don't know, but keep it funny, peculiar. <laughs>